There is a look at the overhead picture of weather across the U.S. Unsettled conditions in West Texas and New Mexico. But out in the eastern U.S., we see a lot of green. So where does that green come from? The GOES satellite actually does not have a green sensor. And the way it computes it is it takes the blue channel and the red channel, and also a infrared channel called the veggie channel. And that's mapped over to green, and that kind of gives us a proxy for the green part of the spectrum. And as a result, we get a pseudo true color image. So that is how it's done. So let's take a look at the weather map for this afternoon. Some rather cool conditions there in West Texas. Some rains helping to break the drought, and they really do need that rain. Stationary front through northeast and east Texas, all the way to Alabama and Georgia, and linking up with an outgoing system across the northeastern U.S. Behind that, some cool westerly winds blowing in through New York and Pennsylvania. A very weak high trailing the back of that cold front, 10, 16 millibars on that. A low pressure area in South Dakota, I didn't really find a front on that. And chances are that could be the remains of an old frontal system, or that could have been spawned by some upscale growth of a mesoscale convective system. I haven't really looked at the data, but that's just my ballpark guess at this time. I didn't mark it on here, but there is a heat low in the southwest deserts, temperatures near 110 around Blythe and Needles. And up to the north, we are expecting a heat wave to settle in across the northwestern U.S. The model is indicating some very hot temperatures coming up for the weekend into Sunday and Monday. And up there in British Columbia, 80s for this afternoon, in those 80s extending all the way into the prairies where we have 90s. Downslope flow contributing to that, so we have temperatures up near 95, 96 around Moose Jaw down towards Great Falls. And going north, there is a powerful system moving through Anchorage at the Sour. Rain and temperatures in the low 50s, hard to believe that you would have to pack a coat going up to that part of the continent. And then looking out towards the east, more cold air filtering in behind this Hudson Bay low. So the cool late summer pattern continues. There's that Hudson Bay low. And that brings us around full circle to the Maritimes Bear Clinic system across Maine, heading out to Newfoundland, Labrador, and the Atlantic. I do want to perform a quick spot check of the upper level conditions, the jet stream, and any blocking patterns, that kind of thing, because we are looking at a possible record-breaking event with that heat in the western U.S. So let's see where we're at. This is how it looks for this afternoon. Cutoff low, way off the coast of Oregon. The main polar front jet up through Alaska, down towards the Great Lakes, and then it becomes more amplified. Now, I did mention that storm system going into Anchorage, that's supported by the jet. It's in the left front quadrant. If you've read my books, you probably understand the four cell quadrant concept. So we have strong upper level lift in that part of the jet. And that supports the development of cyclogenesis in that area. Upper air ridge across the western U.S. extending from this Subtropical high. Let's see how it looks over the next few days. You can see those heights building in the western U.S. as the heat wave gets started. That's Saturday. Little trough moving through on Saturday, and then I think we're going to see that ridge building in somewhat. There it is. That brings us into Monday. And the ridge moves into the northern plains, so some of that heat will likely spread to the east later next week. And that gets us to the end of that sequence. Five to six days out, that's probably good enough. So let's see what we're in for. This ought to be interesting. 
These are the official weather service forecast temperatures. This is from a human, not from the models. That's very important. So for today, some heat all the way down to Los Angeles. Down there, they're expecting near record heat. Burbank 108, that would tie the record set in 2017. And Palmdale, not pictured on there, but they may approach 109. And then up to the north, there it is, 90s. That's all breaking the record for the date. For tomorrow, the first day of September, the heat settles in across the Great Basin area. These are going to be records for the date, 100 at Reno, 94 at Ely, and continued very hot around Los Angeles. And we're definitely not done. Friday records being broken again, especially in Idaho. 102 at Ontario, Idaho, 103 at Pendleton, and 98 up there near just south of Spokane. Yep, you noticed no records in the eastern or central U.S. Temperatures there are pretty close to the normals. But on Saturday, continuing that heat out west, numerous records all the way from Los Angeles up through Montana. For Sunday, it looks about the same, but actually there's some heat settling in across the San Joaquin Valley. Temperatures near 110 at Fresno and Stockton, and some very hot temperatures showing up near the coast of Southern California. I had a check on where that RNM station is. That's Ramona, located inland from San Diego. That's San Diego right there. There's the Mexican border. So that's in the foothills. Expecting some heat there. 105, breaking the record by 3 degrees on Sunday. And it continues into Monday, some rather extreme heat in the San Joaquin Valley, 112 at Stockton. And it's very possible some all-time records could be broken. And the misery continues through Tuesday. Fresno expecting 110. Again, this is not model data. This is human forecast data. So it's going to be quite hot there. This far out, this is going to be biased towards climatology, but we're seeing these rather extreme conditions. So I think that points to some rather severe heat coming up next week, extending all the way up to, towards Idaho. And after that, we'll just have to see. We'll check that out on Friday. And if you want to see some truly ridiculous temperatures, the GFS is known for its rather extreme forecasts. This is just for entertainment purposes, but you can see Friday, the GFS trying to go for 114 around Bakersfield. There's Saturday. There's Sunday. And look at Monday, the GFS trying to go for 117 there around Merced, 116 around Fresno and Bakersfield. And this is the model that was trying to go up to 120 around Oregon last year during that big heat wave. Things really get nuts on Tuesday. There's a 120 at Visalia between Fresno and Bakersfield. So we probably can't use the exact values, but the trends over time are useful. So it looks like the heat continuing through next week and maybe starting to let up towards next weekend. And out in the tropics, it's starting to get active off the Cape Verde area into the southern North Atlantic. Some activity starting to appear on the NHC forecast graphics. One storm way out to sea, expecting 80% chance of cyclone formation there. This is the one of most concern at this time. So the GFS track will be rather useful. It's very important to use a model site that has the ocean basins. A lot of them actually don't have that, but Tropical Tidbits is a good one. And if you go up to the top here in this region select area, you've got all these areas. So we're going to focus on the Tropical Atlantic. So there's our little Tropical Depression right there. Let's run that forward. Not a whole lot of development. It passes north of Puerto Rico and undergoes some intensification there, but recurves very strongly. There's our spread of possible tracks, and uh, it does look like that is the whole thing is pulled a little bit to the north, which is good news because we don't 
want that heading towards Florida or the Carolinas. The GFS has appeared to bring the track a little bit further to the east as well. So this may not be a factor I did mention on the supporter stream on Monday. I was kind of concerned with the ensemble outliers in this area. And there is a little bit of gr grouping right there. I'm going to assume that those are some of the ensemble members. Let's take a look here. Uh, no, that's the Canadian model. Yeah, that's an ensemble. Yeah, these are mostly GFS ensemble members. So we can't totally rule out a westward drift, but the overall consensus is bringing it a little bit more towards the north, and that would be a risk mostly for Bermuda and some of the shipping lanes out east of the U.S., so let us not worry about tropical activity for now. We're going to focus on the U.S. The important product this time of year, of course, is precipitable water. We lean pretty heavily on this during the peak of the warm season going into the fall months. And right there, there's that light purple indicating two-inch precipitable water amounts. No wonder the precip is very abundant in Texas. Also, we can use this to find air masses like up to the north the great lakes area yeah there's the cold dry air spreading into that region looks like a boundary right through here and then the main front further out to the east dividing this dry air in the northeast from the very moist air offshore likewise the continental tropical air across the western u.s that's it half an inch to one inch precipitable water. The monsoon trying to do a little bit of convective development, but not really getting anywhere. Okay, so let's roll that forward. And I'm going to show you one interesting wild card feature coming up for next week. You notice this one hurricane off of Baja, California. Well, there's going to be another one. In fact, let's just go right to it. The GFS was doing this on the Monday runs, and it's continuing to do this, bringing up a small tropical cyclone of some sort into the Gulf of California. And that could spread a lot of moisture into Arizona, West Texas, or New Mexico towards the end of next week. So we're looking at Thursday here. That's still quite a ways out. So we'll just kind of keep tabs on that. Look at the models on Friday and again on Monday. Elsewhere around the country, let's take a look. Roll that back to the beginning. And let's just take a snapshot for Friday night. What we see here, if you look at the isobars, high pressure off of Maine, a stronger high pressure area over Manitoba that's advecting cold, dry air into the North Plains. And you can kind of see where the front is coming down through the Central Plains and about to link up with some of this moisture spreading up from the Western Gulf. And you can see the isobars there in Texas, Oklahoma, indicating stout southerly flow in place. If we go back to today, you can see that southerly flow is not really there. It's kind of washed out. So that flow will be strengthening over the next two days. And that'll help accelerate the advection of moisture northward. So by Monday, a lot of it spreading up into the Midwest, one and a half inch precipitable water all the way into Iowa and Wisconsin. So somewhere in there, there's going to be quite a few showers and thunderstorms. And then going to the end of next week, you can see a front trying to move into the Great Basin area that may break up the heat wave in that region a little bit. Strong cyclonic development, pressure falls, helping to carve out that low pressure area right there. And that'll create a response in the flow on the Great Plains and bring some of that moisture up to the north later next week. And there it is. You can see it heading north, interacting with this front that has pushed out of the Rockies. So precip chances will be going up towards the end of next week. Abundant moisture in the southeastern U.S. So whatever boundaries make it south will help focus precipitation. And also it looks like the monsoon Resuming its activity once again by next week. Let's see when that happens. We start out with things kind of dried out over the weekend. That heat wave really baking things 
in the deserts, and then the moisture starts flowing up later next week. So we will see a pattern change as the week goes on. But for Monday and Tuesday, let's back that up. Monday and Tuesday, heat wave, precipitable water showing dry conditions. That's that subsidence, the air sinking and heating, undergoing adiabatic warming across this area here and pushing those temperatures way, way up. And let's just take a quick look around the country, the northeastern U.S., moving into nighttime. So it's starting to switch over to infrared. But over northern New York into Montreal, some convective clouds associated with the cold air advection, very cold air mass, especially in the mid-levels, moving out over relatively warm terrain. In the southeastern U.S., cool, dry air has pushed south through Atlanta and the Carolinas, but numerous storms in northern Florida and inland throughout the rest of the Florida Peninsula. In Texas, numerous showers, the high precipitable water amounts really doing a number on the state. And then further out to the west, northerly flow. Let me move over and give you a better look at that. Yeah, there it is. You see that? That northerly flow, in fact, a little bit northeast. That's always detrimental to monsoon weather. In fact, you get a little bit of a lee side effect there off the higher terrain, and things end up very dry in the deserts. In the northwestern U.S., well, this is not good news with that heat wave coming up. Some rather intense fires just in the past hour. Here's a closer look at the area. Right here, they were working a fire at Sturgill. And as the afternoon goes on, you can see how that power cumulus really gets going. There are a couple towns near there, Joseph and Enterprise. But it looks like that fire is kind of in this area right here. The plume going over the towns, but looks like most of the fire itself is probably a little ways from those communities. And finally, the north central U.S. Yeah, there's a little MCV right in here. That's pretty interesting. That's probably tied to that surface feature. In the wake, yeah, there is some northwesterly flow. Got some storms developing along the front range into the Denver area, all the way down to Colorado Springs and Trinidad. Other than that, it's uh, pretty quiet. Dakota's looking clear as a bell all the way down to Minneapolis and Chicago. And that's all I've got for your Wednesday edition. Once again, I thank all of our supporters for their contributions, helping to keep this program going. And I'm going to leave you with some footage from Greg once again. Always spectacular. This is the Texas Hill Country just last night with a typical Texas sunset. We'll see you back here on Friday. Hope you have a great evening. Take care, and we'll see you in a couple days. Bye-bye.